Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to this uh, teaching session organized uh, jointly by Orthopedic Research UK and the Orthopedic Academy. The session is focused on um, uh, teaching uh, for the FRCS level. However, it's useful for orthopedic trainees and healthcare professionals um, interested in uh, trauma and orthopedic specialty. Our guest speaker this uh, evening is Mr. Jay Mahalaksumavala, who is a consultant uh, surgeon at the Princess uh, Alexandra Hospital. Uh, he has a special interest in hip and knee surgery. Uh, Mr. Mahalaksumavala is a well-known uh, speaker in the, in the field. Uh, he speaks, uh, has spoken about these topics in many conferences and meetings. Uh, he's also very well known for his, uh, 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 as a trainer um, in the region. He has been awarded the trainer of the year in uh, hospital rotation in, in the past. In addition, Mr. Malak Savala is the co-founder and co-director of the NFRCS course, a face-to-face -face course, um, which he runs once a year, um, previously at the Royal College of Surgeons, and now um, it's Allah Sherman FRCS uh, course. It's a top course and very recommended for everyone uh, to attend. It's a face-to-face -face course, very interactive. Most importantly to us, uh, Mr. Max Zavala has been the godfather of the FRCS uh, mentor group. Um, his support to us uh, has allowed us to continue uh, de delivering this teaching program uh, since January 2017. Uh, this webinar-based FRCS teaching program has helped many colleagues uh, pass their exams. And uh, we owe it to Mr. Malak Savala for his continuous support and encouragement and guidance for us to continue. So we're very pleased that um, he's with us this evening and, um, and I'm sure it's been a very useful uh, session. Uh, my name is Firas Arnaud. I'll be the convener of the session. And we have with us uh, a couple of... Uh, faculty from the Orthopedic Academy. Uh, we have um, Suriram and Abdullah Gabr, both ready with their Viva questions. Um, the session will start with a lecture, um, followed by some MCQs. It will be all anonymized, so we encourage you all to try. Please listen carefully to the lecture so you can answer the MCQs correctly. Uh, and then we offer a hot seat Viva practice session. Uh, this has been proven to be very, very useful to all our colleagues going for the FRCS exam. You will be asked exam-specific question and provided with feedback from the experienced faculty present this evening. So if anyone is interested, please encourage you strongly to express your interest as soon as possible. We only allow the maximum of three questions. Um, so please, if you're anyone interested in taking part in the Hot Seat Viva, please let us know. No, you know, so it's not recorded. The Hot Viva is not recorded, but the lecture is recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel as soon as possible. So without further ado, I will, so one more uh, plugin, sorry. We have an FRCS course, um, interactive, uh, intensive FRCS mock exam course that we have been uh, running now for over two years online. Uh, it's also very popular and uh, our, Next course is on Saturday, 3rd of December, and another one on 28th of January. In this course, we cover VIVA and clinical parts of the exam, and uh, we simulate the real exam scenario. So we cover the same tables as the exam with both clinicals, intermediate and short clinicals, as well as all the VIVA tables. And the candidates are all timed, and they're all given structured feedback on their performance um, during, throughout the course. Um, very high faculty to participant ratio of one to one. So on the day we will have at least 16 faculty teaching uh, each one of you um, and it will be just rotated through. So it's very nice interactive, uh, um, sort of put you on the spot and, and give you a real feel of the exam and the exam experience. So uh, if anyone interested, please you can scan the barcode or um, visit our UK website. Uh, intensive, intensive FRCS mock exam course. So without further ado, I will um, 
leave you now with Mr. Malam Savala. Over to you. Okay. I'll share my screen first. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah. Yes, perfect. We can see your screen if you can just uh, put it on a slide. Share. Lovely. 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 Got that there? Yeah, lovely. Just one minute. Lovely. So, okay, so thank you very much, uh, Feras, for your kind introduction. As you know, it's my passion to be with uh, you and all my colleagues at the Autodic Academy. And Lydia and Hannah, thank you very much from OR UK. Uh, I, before the, the book, Concise Orthopedic Notes, is what the book which I would really not just recommend. It's a book which I also use in I, preparation of many lectures which I give. And I must say, it's something which all of you all must have in the preparation as well as for the future. Okay, so that's one. Firas, just tell me, is a second, I, I, I understand the second uh, edition is out or coming out? No. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, we are working on it. It, it might be um, a year before the oh, next yeah, before. Okay. Okay. comes out because, uh, yeah. So we'll use that. And so now coming on to this topic of hip arthroplasty, I thought that uh, I would use this talk as a, a talk which for people to verbalize in the exam and not only for that, or for all of y'all who are gonna be hip and knee surgeons like myself and Firas. Uh, to a certain degree, I it's a huge topic as you know, and I'm trying to, I'll go away from doing a standard uh, lecture like you talk about history, different types of hips, et cetera, et cetera. I thought I would pick up because we have only half an hour to do uh, topics which I feel are difficult to understand, difficult to comprehend, and what are commonly asked in the adult pathology uh, viva section. So starting at the end of my talk, I thought I'll start first with just talking about offsets. And obviously we have to talk about types of DHR. And that would nicely lead to a common question, which I've talked in other lectures, but it always, every, every candidate is asked as to which hip you will use. And everybody's worried that, oh, he failed me because he's a cemented user and I'm an uncemented user. It's nothing to do with that. There's a way on talking. And also in hip and knee arthroplasty, it's always a concern as to how many papers you need to know, which papers do you need to quote, uh, are they relevant, not relevant? You, you, don't, you may not know that. So I thought I'll just introduce that. And then talking on complex hips, because when difficult x-rays are shown to people, your first, uh, you get a heart sink feeling is, where am I gonna start, where am I gonna end? So I just want that to be clarified. So, so that's all I think I could cover in, three, in 30 minutes. So what is offset? So offset is the distance between the long axis of the femur yeah, so we all agree, long axis of the femur and the center of rotation of the femoral head. And that's the word I want you to use most of the time when you're talking on adult pathology and hip replacements is what is the center of your uh, femoral head or center of rotation. That's what you're aiming for. And just keep in mind that changes with neck shaft angle, yeah? And it changes neck length. So your DHR offset is influenced by neck angle and by neck length. The average offset is 43 and we have a range which is from 27 to 57. And that's the reason why it is important to template. Okay, so that, that, that's there. So tell the examiner that. Then just keep in mind a various neck shaft angle. So if you're in various, so you're like that, you will have an increased offset. And if you have a valgus neck angle, you have a decrease offset, okay? So offset is influenced by your varus or valgus. And therefore, as you know, all of us who use any modern hip system, we'll have our options of a coxavera stem or a coxavalgus stem. And the why is offset important is you need, tell the examiner, you need correct offset or optimal offset. And or increase offset is better, and you get a better lever arm ratio. That's the word you have to use. And you get optimal tension of your abductors, which gives you your stability of your soft tissues and less impingement, okay? So why do you want correct offset? 
is correct offset is optimal for the best abductor advantage, the best abductor lever arm ratio, the best tension in your abductors, which allow less impingement and less soft tissue problems. So the two words which are important in hip arthroplasty will be center of rotation to be restored with correct offset. And hence that leads you the goals of arthroplasty. And I would say my goals in arthroplasty would be restoring hip center, restoring correct offset, equalizing leg lengths, and having a hip which has the best long-term survival. These are the four things which we all want in any hip we do. Where do we, what is the ideal THR? So when you answer the question, first say up hand that my ideal THR is, say you want to use, say you want to use a Coral Pinnacle. So say I use a Coral Pinnacle hip system, or you say like me, I use the Exeter Trident hip system or any Zimmer or any of the companies use the word, but you just can't stop there and keep quiet. You have to justify as to why you're using it. So say I use this, say because my goals of arthroplasty have to be met. And my goals of arthroplasty are such that I need a hip system which will reproduce my normal anatomy. And I need a hip system, hip system which will account for an inventory for all the anatomic variants I come across with all the deformed hips I'm going to take on. Okay, so that's your one. I need a hip system which would have a robust planning or templating kit. So now you can use it computer planning nowadays or using the acetates all over. So I use a robust templating kit. Then say the most important issues for me as a hip surgeon are to restore my offset, to restore my neck angle and my neck length, so as to get my correct hip center. And therefore this system, you can say the Coral, Trident, I'm Coral, uh, Exeter, or whichever you want to say, gives me my armamentarian to fulfill that. Then say, I do want, and I do know, I need an ongoing, stable, hopefully lifelong fixation. I want a long-term track record for survival studies, and hence I use it. And then say, this system which I use has an optimal length, stiffness, and taper, which I do, do know has not caused any undue peak stresses, and it has not caused any undue increased moments, which may have resulted in predecessor stems or other implants, which implant breakage, et cetera. Hence, it got a long-term survival. That's why I use it. And then say, with cost and issue, I do also want the flexibility of bearing services. I do know my default, you can say, my default is ceramic on polyethylene, but I do know, and I want different uh, uh, surfaces available and I want to optimize and have the best head neck ratio. So see in two slides, I've tried to put in the words where you will be asked in the vibe of anything. So keep in mind, just know about head neck ratio, know about different surfaces, the wear rates, know about how stiffness and taper influences or increases the peak stresses. You need to know about the lifelong fixation with a HA coated implant or how triple taper cement stem works. And you need to know the versatility of your offset. So in these two slides, it is something which you can cover most aspects of your heart plasty. And then say, in, without a doubt in my trust, I will need a ODEP high rating and an ICE approved and then there's always a controversy as to how, which paper you talk about. I would say when you talk about any paper in orthopedics, there are only three types of studies which we as orthopedic simple surgeons want to know about. It'll be long-term implant survival studies, that's one. Patient reported outcome measures, that's the second type of big study. And third will be laboratory-based studies. So whichever paper you want to keep for your uh, to prove that you want to use an implant. So if, let's say you want to use an Exeter Trident. You can take one paper, which got a 25 year survival and say, this is a long-term survival studies. So when you're quoting that paper, I would say what you need to do when you quote papers is you don't, you don't know every name of every author. 
you need to know what type of study it is. So say, I do know this is a long-term survival study, or you say, I do know it is a patient reported outcome measure study, or if it's a pure lab-based study looking at ceramic and ceramic wear rates, wear rates in a laboratory, then you say, I do know it's a laboratory-based study looking at wear rates. So introduce it with that heading. Then always use the word, it's a contemporary paper. So last five, 10 years are contemporary studies. If something historical, say it's a historical paper. You don't have to know all the names. You don't have to know the exact month when it was published, but you need to know which center it's come from. And to be impressive, to get a seven or an eight, and even if I'm sitting on a panel or if we all are sitting on a panel to give an opinion, if you say that this is from a journal which has an impact factor X, which you know is higher, then it sounds more impressive. And you need to know the level of evidence. Now in orthopedics for long-term survival studies, it's very difficult to get the gold standard randomized studies, but at least you can say, I do know it's a level three evidence, but this is the paper, it's the best paper we have. So therefore, if you're talking about your hip, your knee, your uh, implant you use like for DHS, just keep one paper which supports its use and try to use these three or four wordings which impresses to get the seven or eight. So moving on, let's move on to how to talk about a difficult hip in arthroplasty. And, but before that, we need to know how to talk regarding a straightforward hip in, in arthroplasty. So uh, let's first talk about a straightforward X-ray, which is put for you. Now, when this X-ray is put up, uh, what do you want to talk about this X-ray? So most people, when they say this X-ray, will say it's a pelvis, both hips, etc., and then immediately start talking about the pathology on the left side. I would say that you first need to say for any adult pathology viva question try to say this x-ray is what, okay? So if it's a, what do you think this x-ray should be in a hip? Now, me as a hip surgeon, I want an x-ray called a pelvis with both hips, AP view. And that's different from my chroma surgeons in the a &E who want a pelvic x-ray where the entire Eli crests are seen. So I tell the examiner, this is a AP pelvis with both hips. However, it is not correctly centered on the symphysis pubis. It should be centered here while it's not centered there. And I need to see more of the shafts. Okay, so that's the first thing you say. The second you'll say is that I want to know where it's correctly rotated. Say the optator foramen, I cannot visualize because of the lead pad, but it may be some rotation on this film. So these are the two things I wanted to open to say in a hip. This is a pelvis, both hips is centered correctly or it's not centered correctly on the symphysis pubis and the optative foramen appear symmetrical or they don't appear symmetrical. If they don't appear symmetrical, then say that there's, there's some degree of rotation to this film. Next, I want you to say that, describe the signs of OA. So the first thing you say is, I notice that on the, on the left-hand side, there are the classical signs of osteoarthritis, which would be, sclerosis of the joint surface, narrowing or near obliteration of the joint surface, osteopite formation, and I cannot particularly see cysts. So say that, and then say that I would therefore call this a straightforward osteoartic hip, and I do not see a gross abnormality of the hip center. All right, so make, say that phrase. So we're gonna say, this is the signs of OA, it is concentric OA is the normal OA you see and mention there's no gross abnormality of the center of rotation of the hip, okay? Then, and then say offset, I will, I will recreate the offset by templating or comparing it to the other side. So that's your straightforward interpretation of an osteoarthritic hip. Now let's see what happens when we have a more difficult hip. So we all agree this is a more complex pathology, right? So where do we start? Where do we end? So the first thing to say is start off by saying this is an x-ray, which is a pelvis to both hips centered on the symphysis pubis. Yes, now you agree this is a better x-ray centering than the previous one. 
then say the optator foramen are not symmetrical. There may be some degree of rotation. Second. Third, I want you to give the barn door of what you see. So say there's no doubt there's bilateral destructive arthropathy of both the hip joints with definite sclerosis of the joint surfaces. There's near obliteration of the joint surfaces. They are osteophyte formation and they are marked cysts or definite cysts with near obliteration of the femoral head. Now, there are four points which I've said. So I've talked about the arthritic changes. And then the, the first thing you say is there's obliteration of the femoral head. So describe the head and then say where the center of rotation of the hip is gone. And the next statement would be, and there's definite abnormality of the center of rotation of this hip with definite superior migration of the, of the head of the femur, right? So what am I going to say? I'm going to say that the hip center is grossly abnormal. And then I would like to describe the head morphology. And what did I say in this one? There was complete destruction of the femoral head. Then next, I would describe that, tell the examiner, or this is what I do in my, when I'm planning a difficult hip, is I describe or I divide the description into the femoral side and the acidular side. Okay, so there's no confusion in my mind as to where my difficulty will lie. All right. So moving on to this one, for example, this one, do you agree again? That is, you're going to say the same thing. This is the AP film, pelvis with both hips, centrum and symphysis pubis, optoreformin appears symmetrical. It is a correctly rotated film. There's definite signs of osteoarthritis in the left hip with complete obliteration of a joint space, osteophyte formation, cyst formation, sclerosis, and the center of rotation is definitely abnormal with superior migration of the center of rotation of the femoral head. And then say, once again, I notice that there's a, a destruction of the femoral head. Now, let's go on to what type of head shapes you can commonly have. So, you remember the first film, which was our normal OA, you're going to tell the examiner the head sphericity is maintained, okay, because it's a round head then you sometimes can have sectoral collapse. So the superior lateral quadrant, you know, the, you know when it starts hitting against the acetal rim, it gets eroded there. So you see that on x-ray, you call it sectoral collapse. Then you can have a completely misshapen or a disshapen head where it's grossly uh, distorted. So let's call it a misshapen head. Then you have, like I showed you, a destructive arthropathy with obliteration of the femoral head. And then you have a coxa magna or a large head. Okay, so these are the all the heads you will see. And I try to put it down. It's not going to be written in any textbook. It's just what I've picked up over the years. So do you agree? In this one, the sphericity is maintained. So you're going to say the femoral head sphericity is maintained. In this one, do you agree? It's a distorted head. Yeah, so it'll be a distorted head or misshapen head. Over here. We've already said it's near destruction of the femoral head. Over here, coxa magna. Yeah, so this is how you'll describe it. Then I want you to move on to the neck area. So now I've divided it. So I've talked about the head. And then I say on the femoral neck, which is this area, I want to describe it. So I describe in my mind what has happened there. So in this case, for example, I talk about the length. So there's a definite shortening of the femoral neck. That's what I'll say. And then in my mind, I want to know whether it's an excessive valgus or varus. And I say it is a normal valgus or varus orientation of this head, of the neck. And then I know, see whether there's any abnormality in the neck area, cysts, etc. All this is important. And if you're doing hip resurfacings, the integrity of your neck is very crucial. So that's why it's important to know. And also when you're templating, you need to know where you are with your neck angle. So let's go back to this. So what do I want to know in the neck? I want to know whether the neck is shortened. I want to know whether it's valgus or varus and whether there are any cysts or any issues in the neck area. After that, I go into the trochanteric area. So I say in the intertrochantric and the subtrochantric area, I notice that there's no abnormality or there's abnormality. 
And what are the abnormalities I look for? There's no evidence of a previous ostotomy. Okay, ostotomies are normally done here. And many of the hips I see now, which I'm operating at 40, 45, would have some degree of ostotomy done when they were younger. So say there's in the intertrochanteric and subtrochanteric area, I see, not in this one, I'm just imagining that I notice that there's an abnormality with a previous ostotomy to be done. We talk about whether there's any metal work there and if there's any remnants or a tract of previous metal work removal. So see the phrase I'm using, because very often you'll see in an x-ray a tract of a, of a screw, a tract of a DHS. So all that is a word you can say, I see a previous tract of a previous metal work. So let's say again, in the intertrochanteric and subtrochanteric area, I look for a deformity, which would be your previous ostotomy. I look for metal work and I look at tract of previous metal work. And then I move on to the shaft area. And the shaft area, I say in this limited film, the, the shaft appears satisfactory with good cortices, with a good medullary canal, with no deformity or previous fracture seen and no metal work. So what do I want to look in the shaft? I want to see whether it's normal. I want to know whether the canal is patent and no fractures. So let's look at each one. Do you agree in this one, the neck is normal, uh, is the neck is shortened with definite cysts over there, but the valgus varus angle is satisfactory. In this one, do you agree? We'll agree that this neck angle is in valgus. So you're going to describe the head. And then when you're going to come into the neck, you say in the neck area, yeah, it is in uh, valgus. You agree here in the subtrochanteric area and the trochanteric area, there's a deformity. It's there on this side as well. But at least we've picked it up. You see the pickup of the deformity in the trochanteric and subtrochanteric area and on this side. And then in the shaft, you see this, you clearly will say, my issue with this case would be that in the shaft area, there's very thick in cortices, there's near obliteration of the canal, medullary canal. So, the, and, but you, there's no fracture scene. So this is the way I would have talked on my femoral side. So just to recap, before we go any further in case it's getting confusing, I first start with the X-ray. I start whether it's centered or rotated. Next, I talk about the barn door arthritic changes, which will be there in a simple hip or a complex hip. Talk about that. Next, talk about the center of rotation of the hip, whether it is near normal or grossly abnormal. Then describe the head of that femur and then move on to the femoral side into neck, intertrochanteric, subtrochanteric, and shaft. All right, so now we finish that. And now let's move on to the acetabular side. As well aside, I would say the first thing you want to look for is can you see the teardrop? Okay, so if you see the teardrop, the medial fossa or the floor is satisfactory or intact. So see the fossa and know in your mind whether the true floor is present. That's one thing. Look superiorly and see whether there is any destruction of the superior lip of the acetabulum, which is there. And I'll show you the cases, but that's a common thing. And then Whenever I asked my registrars, my fellows, my uh, people in courses, describe a hip x-ray and they see a very abnormal hip, they say it's arthritic changes. And they ask, what do you want to do? And immediately, the next question is, I'll do a CT scan. Now, I can't remember. I, I, I do a CT scan very occasionally, but a lot of information is actually got on your plain x-ray. And the plain x-rays, you get that information exactly with the interpretation of your pelvic trauma. So I, on, from today onwards, I want every x-ray to be looked at like you're looking at it from a pelvic trauma point of view. That every ischial line, iliopectineal lines are all have to be drawn. And that gives us the information about the columns and the walls. So let's go through some of them. So on uh, this one, for example, let's say it's put to you like this. What you're gonna say is, let's all say we can visualize the teardrop. Yeah, we can visualize a teardrop there. So you can say, therefore, the medial wall would be intact, correct? Let's move to this side now. You're gonna say there's definite destruction of the superior lip 
of the acetabulum with superior migration of the femoral head. Then you're going to say, you're going to talk about your iliopectineal and your ilioischial lines. And you agree, at least on these x-rays, the iliopectineal, what would it represent? The anterior wall and the ilioischial will be the posterior wall. So you know at least the, oh, sorry, the columns. So these two columns are intact and the walls are also intact. What may not be visible here is your posterior wall. So for that, you can say I'll need a lateral view or I'll need a, a CT scan. But most of your columns, okay, your definite anterior column and your posterior column and your medial wall is given me information from this plain x-ray. So, so that's there. Now look at this one. Well, this one, do you agree, is a protusio, but why? Because we know our line is drawn and the head and the acetabular fossa is beyond the iliopectineal line. Okay, so that's where you're So lines give us a lot of information onto where we are. And we need to know what is called as the acetabular index. So if you draw a line from the teardrops and you draw another line to the edge of the acetabulum, if that edge, suppose the edge is destroyed and it's here. So let's go back to this one. Do you agree that if you draw a line at the bottom of the teardrops there and you draw a line from here to the lip here, it's a lesser, this angle is different from if the angle was there. So once you have this angle, that's your acetabular index. And that gives you information that the superior lip is destroyed. Now that's the difference between calling this, a, this is not a dysplastic, it's dysplasia from the anatomy, but it's nothing to do with dysplasia where the patient was born with, but it's destroying the superior lip. In Fertugio, I've said, we need to know the lines. So the head and the acetabular fossa is beyond that line. And look at this one. Now, when we are talking about this side, Yeah, when you're talking about this side, let's say you have this picture shown to you. So you've talked about the femoral side, which is grossly abnormal. So you're going to tell the examiner, I notice the femoral neck is shortened. I notice in the intratrochantric and subtrochant area, there's a deformity. Look at the deformity. Yeah. You're going to say, my main worry is there's gross sclerosis of the femoral uh, cortices. There's near obliteration of the canal. However, on my acetabular side, more or less, I can see the teardrop. There's no really increased angle in the acetabular index. It's sclerosed, but more or less is a straightforward acetabulum. All right. And then now I have to verbalize in the last five minutes. Uh, Firas, I have five minutes. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah. So. So now that I've made my uh, entity as to where my issue is, in all the cases that I've shown you, either the problem will be on the acetabular side or on the femoral side. It's very unlikely to be on both. So when you have to verbalize how will you manage these complex cases, say that I have taken a history and just immediately say, don't say this patient can be treated conservatively and operated. No, you cannot. Since that's a destructive arthropathy, there's no conservative animal management. Just say that assume you have taken a history, completely examined the patient, and all conservative measures have been exhausted, and this patient obviously is in significant pain, and there are no contraindication to joint replacement surgery, this patient merits bilateral complex hip replacement at a stage setting. That's what you will say. And then immediately say it is complex surgery, because part of your remit as your level is to identify complexities of surgery. And why is it complex? The issue is complex in hips because of either exposure, either because of hip center restoration, two, or there's a complexity on the femoral side and the acetabular side. So in exposure being difficult, I aim to get exposure and dislocation safely, okay? And that issue will be a worry in three types of conditions. One in protusio, two in ankylosis, and three in co coxa magna. So we agree exposure is going to be difficult in this case, where you have to do in situ. It's going to be difficult in this case, and it's going to be difficult in this case. 
Now, once I've got my exposure, the acetabulicide restoration of my joint center is I have to localize the true flow and place my cup where the true flow is. That is always inferiorizing. So my cup, whether it's cemented or uncemented, doesn't matter. I have to get it inferior where the true flow is, which means indirectly, once you put your cup inferiorly, then the superior part, which has been destroyed, has to be filled up with something, okay? And that superior part, which had been destroyed and needs to be filled up, has to be made from an uncontained defect into a contained defect. And the areas in hip arthroplasty where we have, are going to have uncontained defects are most of the time superior and medially. So this is the place where we need always some augmentation. And that augmentation could be in three forms. Just remember this. One is if it's contained, that's good. If it's uncontained, we have to make it contained. And then we can use impaction bone grafting. We can use structural bone grafting, or we can use augments like uh, wedges, et cetera. And the last thing you need to know in complex hip surgery are the columns and walls intact. So in this one, do we agree that a superior lip migration, I'm going to place my cup inferiorly. I'm not going to put my cup here. I'm going to put my cup here where the teardrop is, which means this area is going to be an uncontained defect. How do I get this uncontained defect? A, I can use a mesh with bone graft morselized at the back. Two, I can use a structural bone graft over there, or I can use a metal augment, okay, which is trabecular metal. I can use all three. I've used all three. What do you think I've used in this case? So in this case, I cup inferiorly. This defect, I put a mesh, bone graft, and then screws and a mesh. And remember I told you with the posterior wall, I had to put a mesh posteriorly as well. So this is complex surgery, but if you notice the hip center is being restored, the hip is down now, he's got his length back. And this is not immediately post-op, but after a while, see how well all this bone has uh, become like new bone. So this is what I use for this case. Same thing there. So imagine I'd got the hip center down, put bone graft there, and a mesh and screws. On the femoral side, all you want to know is, will it be difficult? Will, it, will I have to get the hip down so much there'll be a sciatic nerve issue? Will I have to do a soft release or a resection of bone? And the femoral side, just make sure that the canal is patent, the metalwork is removed, the deformity is sorted, or do you need a short stem? In this one, do you agree, I would have struggled a, on the dislocation, so I osteotomized there. The acetabulum was straightforward. I would dream and get it out. My femur was a struggle. I had to really get my canal patent, and then this is what I did. Yeah. So, so I'll end with this slide because this, I think it's just 30 minutes. So what I've tried to do is I've tried to put through my own experiences, which I think will help you to talk in the exam. and. Therefore, look forward to adult pathology on hip and talk like this. It may impress the examiner and at least you'll get a confident of tackling any difficult hip, which is you've come across with the correct words. So thank you for that. That's wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Malam Suvala, for this uh, concise but also very comprehensive um, lecture. Uh, focusing on how to answer questions related to hip replacements in the exam. As you said, it's a, it's a massive topic and there's no way you can cover it in half an hour, but this is a very... Sorry. sorry. And uh, very excellent recap of uh, the main concepts uh, of hip arthroplasty. And very interesting cases also. Thank you, Paris. Uh, so we have a question. Uh, those uh, from Azim, he asked uh, about these destructive lesions. Can you describe them as AVM or, or would that be committing yourself? 
No, that's a good question. I, I mean, I, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is without a doubt bond or avian. So whoever says this is very correct. Uh, so just say that it's uh, very likely significant ovascular necrosis leading to a destructive arthropathy. All I would say is that because it's bilateral, uh, it's very likely bilateral AVN. However, if it was one-sided and it, we saw such a destructive arthropathy, all I would probably do, which I did in this case, is just tell the examiner, or even in real life, if you were tackling a patient like this, if your serial x-rays before, well, say let's four months ago, was relatively satisfactory, and then you had a very rapidly progressing destructive arthropathy like this, always think of infection, right? So you would want to do a full account ESR, CRP, probably it'd be safer to aspirate the hip to confirm it wasn't any infection. Now, bilateral uh, infective arthropathy is near to zero. So in the case I showed, I would not particularly say that, but even if someone said, I would always worry about infection, that's something to think about. But the direct answer to the question is very correct. This was ABN, and I think that's right. Many people, when I ask this, they always say it's dysplasia. It cannot be dysplasia because it's a, it's a destructive arthropathy. Thank you very much. And uh, I had one other question sent to me. Uh, a lot of candidates um, worry about answering this question about uh, what's your favorite prosthesis or which, which hip replacement would you do? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very common exam question. Um, a lot of the time is unnecessarily answered badly because we worry that we always have to say Exeter or whatever, and we always have to say. Exactly. It, but, uh, you know, uh, you laid down uh, very nicely the principles of how to answer this question. The examiner is not really interested in, you could say any prosthesis you want, as long as you can back it up with those principles of NJR, ODIP, patient reported outcomes and any published literature yeah you could yeah. the examiner really interested to know that you are using a safe uh, prosthesis that has long-term results right. um, that's that's our it has to be one of the top prostheses as well that has the best results because there's no reason why you would not use it a top prosthesis so that's they're interested in the principles. If you tell them yeah. etc., that's you're not going to score anything. Yeah. <laughs> We're very correct for us. I completely agree, and that's why please don't get stressed with this question. It's and don't just answer it like Firas has said. And if they want to use this as a setting question, also to lead on to something, just all the points are there are going to be expanded on. So if they want to talk about varying surfaces, then you will know one or two points on the where it's right if they ask you about a head neck ratio you'll know two sentences of that so just expand on these uh uh phrases yes Piraz, i completely agree and gotham is asking um how would the valgus or varus affects the femoral offset it's a biomechanical now uh, biomechanics now we're moving basic sciences but the 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 the, the, the way it'll influence your offset is that if you have a varus your because you're going down in your angle right the distance will be changed between your center of rotation of your head and the shaft of your femur and hence you'll have what is called as an increased offset but theoretically and even practically you will not have an increase in limb length of that patient so very often I've stopped using Coral now, but when I used to use a lot of Coral, it's an excellent stem. My default was not the normal. I used to use the Coxavera because that means that you can, let's say you've put in your stem, right? And you're doing your final reduction with a trial and it's still long. Instead of trying to get the lesser size prosthesis down further in, if you go to a Coxavera and then put your minus head on, you will be able to get your better correct offset will be, uh, I mean, your limb length will be better. So the answer is that an increased a coxavera will increase your offset. Yeah. Thank you. That was uh, very clear. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Uh, we have another question from Zakaria about what's your preference, allograft or uh, trabecular metal to fill? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, in both the cases I showed, practically, I know I'm, uh, I use more of impaction grafting with a mesh because I feel most of the defects we get right are, bit, are reasonable enough that we can't not use something. And even the smallest, I find the smallest trabecular metal, which is there, may be too big for that defect which we are trying to fill. So, therefore, I tend to use the impaction grafting behind a mesh. So I put the mesh on, get it down to where I feel it needs the coverage, then impaction bone graft behind it. And that's what I tend to do. But there's no right or wrong answer. But if you use trabecular metal, keep in mind sometimes you'll have to ream that defect a little more to get the smallest trabecular metal in. Okay, so that's what you'll have to do. But trabecular metal, for most uncemented users, that is their default and they do it all the time. And that's a very acceptable way of doing it. Lovely. I've done it, but uh, this is where I found sometimes I prefer that. The third one, just to be on this topic, is where you can deck a structural bone graft from a patient's, you can't use a patient's femoral head because most of the time that patient's femoral head is destroyed. So use an aloe graft and use a number seven graft and place it the other way around and two screws to hold it there. So that's your structural bone graft, which can be used. So there are three ways in the world of tackling this. But whatever it is, jumbo cups, which is in the past 20 years ago, I know when I started, uh, people used to try to use a large cup, okay, called a jumbo cup with screws. That certainly is now not acceptable. It causes all your problems of impingement. It causes buttock pain. It's not to be used. So let's say just saying I'll, I'll go and expanding to the size of the defect and use a 60 millimeter cup or a 60 set or 68 millimeter cup, that's wrong. And superiorizing your cup just because you can't get your cup down is wrong. So whenever you ream a normal hip, whenever you ream an abnormal hip, your hand always down. Okay, so really, You'll never, your mistake always, we look critically at your x-rays, you'll never get your cup lower. You'll always get it wrong by going higher. So the two wrong things are jumbo cups. And the second is to put your cup positioned higher because, well, you got it wrong. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. That's uh, very clear. I think we can move on now to the MCQ part of this uh, teaching session. Um, so Mr. Malik Zumala has prepared some MCQs, please, uh, guys, um, everyone, we encourage everyone to try to answer them. Uh, they are all anonymized. Uh, please give them your best shot. They present it to you. We'll give you around three minutes to answer all these three MCQs and we'll then go through the answers. Please, everyone try to answer, give it your best shot. Um, Questions anonymized, uh, answers anonymized. So, um, just a reminder as well: you we have two volunteers for the hot seat viva session. Uh, we we have a place for the third person. If anyone interested, otherwise we will just do the two. So the two candidates interested in the viva are Garrett. Yeah, Gareth Chan and Osama al Ubaidi. Um, we have a third one now. So I think we, Muhammad, Muhammad Arafa is the third one. So that's it. So we have three now.
Coming in, perhaps? Yeah, all coming in. We almost three minutes now. Um, few more seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Three minutes now. I think we can end the poll now and uh, share the results. Um, that's good. We've got the results now shared. Um, yeah. so first one, first, I don't know, can you see, Jay? Can you see yeah, the yeah. Um, exactly? Answers? So, with a, yeah, so yeah. with a various option, a femoral stem cause lengthening, very kindly, uh, someone very asked the question, and more or less for us, we discussed this that, yeah, the various actually is a better option because you can get your better offset, which is always good for your abductor functioning without compromising your neck length. Okay, so that was the answer for that. Uh, the second one is, will a various option cause a decrease in the bending moments? So now the answer is no, because a various option actually causes an increase in the bending moment in the proximal femur. And in the past, why stems were not made at less than 135 was because if they made stems at 127, 130, which is actually closer to the normal population than 135, right? 135 is not the average population neck angle. The normal average neck angle is less. It's about 129, 130. So the question you have to ask yourself is why were DHSs, why was the Charnley hip, why were they all made at 135? So the question is that in the past, when you made your hips, at say, let's 120. Then the bending moments in the proximal femur were a lot, especially with stair climbing and getting up from a sitting position. And therefore in the old days, when metallurgy was not very advanced, you had what is called as uh, implant fracture. So that was very common in Charnley's when I was starting doing revisions. Now, if you notice those of us do, I mean, you don't hardly get stem breakages. So because of better metallurgy, you can go for your various options, okay? So the answer is no, actually a various causes an increase in the bending moments. Okay, perhaps I move to the third one. Yes, please, yeah. And will a various option in a femoral stem improve abductor function? Yes, and the reason we should say yes is just keep in mind, various increases offset and increases offset improves abductor function. So one leads to the other. Okay, so that's where, where, where it is. The joint reaction force may be more, but at least your abductor function is improved. And therefore I would say that a various option improves abductor function. So the answer is yes for the majority. So, and why I put these three questions is I didn't want to ask the same questions I asked in my talk. I thought I'll do, I'll touch on these three top, uh, this topic. So in other words, I managed to give 40 minutes of something rather than overlapping it in 30. Yeah, fair. Any questions on that? No, that's wonderful. Uh, wonderful. Uh, wonderful questions. Thank you very much. They're very important concepts uh, there uh, with the virus. Uh, confuses people, isn't uh, yeah, that, that's now it? Yeah, just keep that in mind. Yeah, these, these, these phrases and thoughts. Yeah. I think generally virus is good. Generally yeah. speaking, yeah. is good. Better offset it gives you better offset, better abductor functions. Yeah. So generally, it's it's good. Yeah, but Keep not excessive. Yeah. Aim for optimal, and I think you're right. Better or optimal? That will be the best word to use for the exams. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again, Mr. Malaksimavala, for this uh, wonderful Perfect. lecture and take us through taking us through this um, uh, difficult topic. We can.